When I was younger, uh, my parents would often say to me and my brothers, wait for me to go with you, right? Especially getting out of the car, crossing the street, going through a parking lot, even do not go out in the front and play by yourself or whatever. That's another one that lately, hearing with my nieces and nephews. This is something that also that uh, King Saul, the first king of Israel, is told by Samuel, who is a very good prophet. He tells him, wait for me to come before you go into battle and I will present a sacrifice to God. And as simple as that instruction seems to be, Paul, or Saul has a problem with that because things are not going so well. And his army is lead, leaving him they're panicking. He starts to panic, and Samuel is not there. So he decides to not wait any longer, and he offers up the sacrifice himself. And just after he finishes it, wouldn't you know that Samuel comes into the camp. And Samuel says something to King Saul that is the same phrase that is said to Adam and Eve by God in Genesis 3 after they sinned by eating the forbidden fruit. He says, what have you done? Eventually, God removes his spirit, his presence from Saul, which he had given to him. And he gives it to one who will listen to him, who is obedient, who has a heart like his own, King David, one who will honor him. Well, today is the first of a two-part series uh, in regards to Pentecost. It'll come to uh, culmination next week. And we're looking at the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a continuation of the book of Luke. It's the same author. <clears throat> and in Luke, at the end of that gospel, Jesus appears to his disciples in the flesh after he had died and was resurrected. He opens their minds to understand what he, has been, what he had been teaching them and how it relates to everything that's going on, that he was the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament scriptures. And in Luke 24, which is the very end of the gospel, what it says here is from 46 to 53, and he said to them, Jesus, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day and rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city, that is Jerusalem, until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them, and while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. We're going to look at three very important subject matters at the very beginning of the book of Acts. First 14 uh, verses, which preclude Pentecost and reveal the message today intended for us. So the first section of the three is the command to wait for the promise It says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Theophilus, this is a name... Uh, I don't think I've ever heard uh, before uh, between friends or anything around me, but Theophilus, it, the name means lover of God, um, loved by God, friend of God, ultimately, is what this name means. And at the beginning of the book of Luke, he is also addressed, saying that the author of Luke, who is Luke, said that he had carefully recorded and validated from eyewitnesses of all these accounts regarding Jesus over a long period of time so that the reader could have absolute certainty of the accuracy of these things that are in his gospel. Theophilus most likely was a monetary supporter of uh, the writings of Luke. 
was interested in having an accurate account of the gospel of Jesus. And that's why he's mentioned in it. Jesus presented himself to his apostles, those eyewitnesses, students of his, who were sent out to speak what they had seen and what had been taught to them. He proved to them that though he died, now he was risen. He had risen from the dead. And it also shows that he spent 40 days with them and continued teaching them about the kingdom of God. So continuing. And while he's staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So staying with them 40 days, definitely uh, the word staying with him means eating with. So fellowship, intimate fe fellowship. We talked about this before that actually infers even covenant sometimes. Um, the 40 days is interesting because that definitely also parallels the 40 days that Moses spent with God up on the mountain. 40 days that God revealed himself to humanity, to a human. Well, same idea that's happening here. For 40 days, Jesus spent time with them in his risen uh, body. So Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise. This is a command. It's not an option. Wait for the promise of the Father. The promise is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is something that the world has never seen before up to that point. A new presence of God is about to come among his people. See, God's presence is the whole point of the Bible. You've heard me say that many, many times before. We had the presence of God in Genesis 1 and 2. He walked among Adam and Eve in the garden. And in Genesis 3, we lose it because of the sin, eating the forbidden fruit. And from that point, Genesis 3, all the way to the very last chapter in the Bible, Revelation, we see what God is doing to bring that back, to bring the presence back to a remnant of people. And it continues to get greater and greater as we go through the Bible. Moses understood how important God's presence was among his people. In Exodus 33, 15 through 16, this is after the golden calf incident. And Moses goes back up to the mountain up to God to intercede for his people and God says well you can go forward but I'm not going with you I'll put an angel basically before you but you're I'm not going to go with you and this is what Moses says if your presence will not go with us we're not going anywhere he says and this is so profound he says is it not your going with us that makes us distinct from every other people on the earth, from every other nation. And that's my question to us. What makes Christianity so much better than all the other religions? One simple thing. God's presence dwells within the believer in Christ. No other has that. None other. Is it not your going with us that makes us distinct from every other people on the earth? Amen. That's exactly the case. Every one of the heroes of the Old Testament were somehow empowered by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Samson, all of the judges, Samuel, David, Elijah, Elisha, Micah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you can go through all of them. And none of them were perfect, but either way, all of them had the power of the Holy Spirit working somehow among them, in them. And baptized means submerged, overwhelmed, saturated by. This is the whole point of Jesus dying on the cross was to justify us before God that he took the price, paid the price for us of our sins against God and when we have the blood of Christ on us, God sees us and he sees that the price has already been paid, that we've been justified before him, purified. So therefore, we are able to receive the Holy Spirit 
Because the temple in the Old Testament, before his presence came upon it, the temple had to be purified. Same idea, except for God's presence isn't coming on a building anymore. It's coming on the individual. His presence now, his spirit lives in the person. Whole new presence. If that's the grand finale, if that's the whole point of that, is to, to bring the Holy Spirit to dwell within the person, why would we leave before the grand finale? Jesus' own ministry starts with his baptism. He's baptized by water, and the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. See, Jesus knows the power, the importance of the power of the Holy Spirit. His people can do nothing apart from it. The presence of God with them. On Christmas morning, my brothers, when we were growing up, and I would have to wait up at the top of the stairs. We had a two-story place. Uh, and we would have to wait at the top of the stairs. And downstairs in the family room is where the presents were waiting for us. So we had to wait upstairs. My parents had to get up and brush their teeth. And they'd take their time just to make us squirm and complain and stuff. You know, come on. We had to wait and wait and wait. So they get the cameras all set up also at the same point. Waiting's hard. Waiting's hard. Do we have the same heart as Moses regarding the presence of God? Without your presence, God, going with us, we're not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere without you. Because apart from his presence with us, we truly are no different than any other human. There's nothing special about us. No matter how hard it is to wait, we must listen to this command to wait for the presence. With it, we show that we are part of a divine family. So the second section is the ascension. Jesus left. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, is not it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. So many people have tried to figure out when evil will be totally wiped out, right? Day of the Lord. The day that God finally says enough is enough. The second coming of Christ, all of these things are the same thing. Judgment day. They think that it's in the Bible, but it's not. Some people, I know, was it Isaac Newton who actually almost went insane trying to decode uh, the Bible, thinking that it was in there somehow? And that was a pretty intelligent guy. Those who think they got the book of Revelation all figured out, and they know who the Antichrist is, they know the day that the Christ is coming back, they do not. I don't care how many books they've sold. See what Jesus is telling us here? It is not... For you to know. It's hidden. It's not for you to know. The time or seasons, the fixed time, the judgment day, day of the Lord, the book of Revelation does not tell us, nor does any other part of the Bible tell us exactly when the end day is. It does tell us what will happen in the end times. It does tell us how we are to face it how we are to engage it. And that is exactly what Jesus uh, gets into next. But things will absolutely get worse. And we see that now happening everywhere. It is getting worse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. The point that he's getting to here is don't worry about the day, the specific day of the end. Rather, know that I'm giving you the power to know to do what needs to be done between now and then. You will be my witnesses. Starting in Jerusalem, moving out to the ends of the earth. This is the focal point of where God says, this is where my salvation is starting, 
but it is for the whole world, but it starts here in Jerusalem, there is still much work to be done. All who, have sa who are saved are required to participate in the ministry of, the, of God, of the advancement of his kingdom, period. Empowered, he empowers us to face every adversity through his spirit. That's the point of it. To glorify him truly like we were always meant to be glorifying. Not ourselves, but to him. To overcome the opposition. We join forces with the Lord for advancement of his kingdom into this dark and corrupt world. We are to do it with the Holy Spirit, not alone. If these Jewish disciples are going to take their testimony into the world, language is going to be a problem. There's a few more languages than Hebrew out there. A few. But God will provide. Even with that obstacle, he will provide. We will see that more next week. Often God brings us to a canyon in our paths with him. He allows us to look across this intimidating expanse between us and the other side and just sit there and go, whoo, that's a long way from here to there. And it forces us to make a choice. Either go back and sit down or pray and ask God to come into this situation and say, because we realize I'm not going any further on this journey unless God gets involved. I can't do anything to get across this place, but he can. So it's in those places that our faith is tested, but also that we are to turn to God and he will provide a way to the other side, guaranteed. So continuing, and, the, and while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in their white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Second Kings chapter two, Elijah, Elijah with a J, is carried up by chariots of fire into heaven before Elijah you would think they'd make a little more of a distinction between these two names, but Elijah and Elijah. Elijah is taken up by chariots of fire. He knows that he's going to be taken up. Both of them actually do. Even on the day that, they're going to be, that he's going to be going up. And, and Elijah keeps telling Elijah, stay in this city as we go through it. Stay in this city and let me go on because God's going to take me up. And Elijah says something to him. Three times he says the same thing that Ruth says to Naomi in the book of Ruth. As the Lord lives, I will not leave you. As the Lord lives, I will not leave you. Complete loyalty and dedication. Total. It's another indication that work still needs to be done, and Elijah knows it. He's dedicated to the work and the ministry of Elijah. Elijah even asks for a double portion. And don't get confused on this. Don't think that he's saying, I want twice as much as what you've done, Elijah. I want to be even greater than you. A double portion is what the eldest son would get in a family, an inheritance. That means if you had, say, two sons, then the oldest would get twice as much than the younger one because the oldest one was the one that inherited really the, the responsibility of the family, took care of all of the rest of the family ultimately. So they got a double portion. What he's basically saying is allow me to have the fullness of the spirit that was on you, allow it to, to be transferred to me. And Elijah says what you've asked is a big deal. That's big. And what he says to him. Uh, he says, if you see me, go up. If you see as God takes me up, then it'll be so. But if you don't see me, it won't. And Elijah does see him, and it's very clear that he has the power of Elijah's spirit comes upon him, and he continues on that ministry with great power and authority. The disciples 
are watching Jesus as he ascends to heaven signifies that like Elijah, the disciples are going to inherit the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the same one that was on Jesus is the one that's going to be coming on them. Hence, the very name, apostles, which means the sent ones with authority and power from Jesus Christ. Two men, mirrors, that are there as witnesses, clothed in dazzling clothing. It uh, mirrors in Luke 24, the resurrection after the death of Jesus at the tomb. Two men in dazzling apparel who are testifying to Jesus' resurrection to the women. They are also witnesses to the fact that he is coming again at the end of days. They refocus the men back to earth. There's still work to be done. Quit looking up to heaven. Come back here. If we liken this situation to a football game, it would be as if Jesus was playing with us in the first of the four quarters. And afterwards he says, yeah, this first quarter's been pretty rough. But something's going to change these last three. I now have given you the power to finish this game with a totally different form of my presence. Physically, I'm leaving. But I will still be with you. Oh, and by the way, we definitely do win this game. We might be shocked that he's leaving, but Jesus informs us that this new presence will exist now in each and every one of us with great power. He will not be one, but many, all able to go forward in the power of God. Whoa. You must play the rest of the game together, Jesus says. If you try to do it without me, there's no way that that person will survive the opposition. Stay in me and you can't lose. Of course we would prefer, prefer to jump right to the celebration, especially when we know we win this game. But Jesus says there's a lot of game left. Don't worry about the celebration yet. Stay focused on the game. Knowing that God wins, it should give us encouragement, especially when times get tough. But if we're only focused on the one day and then we just sit back and wait, that's not what we're called to do either. We still do have a journey ahead of us. Has that been some of us that we sit back? We do little for the game, for the advancement of the kingdom and simply look forward to the celebration. We are called to get involved with the game, not just watch, but to embrace the moment that we are in now any way that we can, even if it is just in by praying. Whatever we can do, everyone can do something. Everyone can do something. And know that we have the power of God that is with us. Amen? Amen. Third and final section is the waiting. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James, all these were, all these with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Olivet is the place of olives, Mount of Olives also, and it's highlighted up here. For some reason, my laser is not working. The red, um, it's circled with that star up there also in the upper right-hand corner is where the Mount of Olives are. It's on the east side of Jerusalem, and it overlooks, it's actually high enough where it overlooks into the temple. Militarily, this was not very good to have outside of your city. It's a great place to just catapult stuff into the city and through the walls. And it's exactly what did happen. This is a very important part of, uh, in history for Old Testament and also for the New Testament. In Zechariah 14, the day of the Lord is what it's talking about in that particular chapter. 
And it says, all the nations will come against Jerusalem to battle. Many will fall, but the Lord will go out and fight against those nations. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives and it will be split in two and a place of refuge for his people and all will be formed and all the angels of God will be coming in with him. <laughs> That's pretty intense. That is where that's supposed to take place, right there. Same place where Jesus ascended is the same place that that will take place. <clears throat> Olivet Discourse speaks of the end times. That's where it was given, where Jesus talks about in the end, the different things that you'll see that will be happening. He doesn't give us the date again, but he tells us these are the kind of things that will be happening during that time. Don't be deceived. He prays out in this area often when he goes to Jerusalem, especially um, uh, the week before the, uh, basically of his passion, before his crucifixion. He goes out and stays out in that area in the evening and prays out there often. The palms also that were given on Palm Sunday were from that area most likely and he came right through that when he came in in his triumphant entry to Jerusalem. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem at one point, saying, if you only recognized me when I came, but you do not know the things that make for peace. And hence, what he's basically saying is you do not understand God's way, and you didn't even recognize your God when he came to you. Therefore, destruction is coming upon you. And that's why he's weeping. He says, I wished to gather you together like a hen gathers its chicks, but you did not recognize me when I came. This is where David stopped when he was leaving Jerusalem, when he was fleeing from Absalom, his son, and stops to weep as well. This was also considered a garden, Gethsemane, same place. Isn't it interesting that also in Genesis 3, the sin, the first sin of the world happened in a garden as well? Jesus is betrayed in a garden. He ascends to heaven in a garden. He will come back in a garden. Sabbath day journey was very close, as you can tell. They could not go very far at all, so therefore this is very close to them. The upper room, it very well could be the very place that they had the Lord's Supper is where, where this could be. The 11 disciples, missing one, Judas, who hanged himself after betraying Jesus, are named. Even in the next section, they actually replace Judas, we see, to bring it back up to the number of 12. But with one accord, all of these people, the disciples, the mother of Jesus, his brothers, all of the women that traveled with, excuse me, with them were there together. And what were they doing? They devoted themselves to prayer during this time of waiting. They prayed. Why? They're praying for the big guns to come in. And it did. They're waiting for the promise of the Father and Jesus. They're holding their hands up to Him in their time of need, like children to a father or a parent. And they knew that the Word of God would not fail them, that He would pick them up. There are many other times in the Bible where God's people were waiting on a promise the Exodus, you see at the very beginning of it, says that they were severely oppressed and in slavery and they cried out to their God and wondered where he was. They were supposed to be the chosen people and there they are enslaved by the most powerful nation in the world. But it says that God saw and he remembered his promise to Abraham. In the judges, every time they strayed from God, it allowed an enemy to overtake them. They cried out to God, and eventually, he also came to rescue them by sending a judge to free them. From exile to the birth of Christ, God's people had been allowed to return to the promised land, but they were still under the rule of Rome. They cried out to God, and this time, God's not dealing with Rome. He's going after something much greater than Rome. He's going after sin itself, death. The whole issue from Genesis 3, he's going to reverse the curse and heal and bring life to where there's death, 
to bring light where there's darkness. And the second coming of Jesus is another time of waiting. This is where we are today. There are great odds against Christians all over the place as the world gets darker and darker. They're still good in this world. But it is getting darker. And we know that Jesus told us that he's coming again to judge and abolish all evil. A number of years ago when I first felt God was calling me into ministry, I started looking at seminaries and stuff to go to. Right when I, I was like, okay, this is the one I know that he's leading me to. This is definitely it. I was about ready to fill out the application and submit and everything. In fact, I think I had most of the application even filled out. I was about ready. I was like, tomorrow I'm going to submit the, the, the application and everything. And I very clearly felt and heard him say, wait. Not yet. I was up on the deadline as it was. So I'm like, not yet means not this year. <laughs> <laughs> not like, not today, not any time in the near future, wait, kind of thing. Was not happy. Furious was probably a better word to say. But I waited. I found another job. It was two years be more before I ended up coming back to that place. And I realized in that time, looking back, that I had some maturing to do in a Christian sense and leadership and even prepping for seminary. You must be careful not to get too excited like children running ahead in a parking lot. When he tells us to wait, we need to wait. He is the power, the protector, which separates the divine children from that which is common. Where have we each failed to wait on the Lord? I guarantee you every one of us have done that somewhere. And after we, I mean, it's so easy because especially if he's like, this is the path, and then we get all excited because we're like, that makes all the sense in the world because I'm good at that. So I know how to do this. Don't worry, I got it from here. I'll be back in a few minutes. I'm good, right? And we come back, beaten up and fat lip and bloody and... <gasps> what happened? And that's what he says. What happened? Did you forget something or someone? Yeah, maybe you could go with me this time. Ah, yes. Maybe I should have gone with you on that. Exactly. Exactly. It can be exciting or terrifying when we see the door open, but if we go through it without God's presence, we absolutely will not succeed, no matter how talented that we are. But if a Christian, in conclusion here, individual or community, a church, goes forward with the Holy Spirit in any endeavor, it will succeed beyond a doubt, no matter what comes against it. When Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches, and apart from me you can do nothing, but in me you will bear much fruit, he's speaking of this very issue. We must understand that the Lord's presence alone is what makes us distinct among all other people. This is what allows us to glorify God and not ourselves when whatever we do. Therefore, we must wait and pray for God to have his presence among us. If we understand that the reason why he put that chasm out there in the first place is even if we don't want to give him the credit for it, people aren't going to look at it and say, oh yeah, that's, that sounds like something Derek could do or whatever this person could do. People look at it and go, that's a miracle right there that just happened. We can't even take the credit if we wanted to. The waiting exposes our faith in the promise of the Lord. He says he's going to be there. He's going to be there. His word is trustworthy and true and we have nothing to fear is what that tells everyone when we wait. So the proposition today is that we must be a people who proceed only with the presence of the Lord. We must be a people who proceed only with the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen.
Let's pray.